Probably most of you, many of you have played that word association game, you know, where you're giving out a word and then, and then you're supposed to respond with what comes to your, to your mind. Uh, you're supposed to respond out loud, but don't do that. Let me, let me just give you a couple of them, a few of them to begin with. Uh, in, when, when you think of uh, or hear the word Brussels sprouts, what runs through your mind? I, I know there are some crazy people that really enjoy it. I, I don't know, but they, they like it. Uh, how about, you know, let's start poking. How about Ford? How about Chevy? You can have those discussions afterwards. How about chocolate? How about the Washington football team? How about, <laughs> how about church? When you hear the word church, what do you think of? And you've probably been in, involved with individuals around, and when they heard the, hear the word church, they think in terms of, well, uh, church is meeting someone for coffee at Panera Bread or Dunkin' Donuts, that's church. Church is playing tennis on a Sunday morning, if you can work some spiritual talk into that conversation. Or others would say, I don't really need a church, uh, there's so many other things to do, so many other choices, it's, it's just one of many that's on that particular list. There are those who bounce from church to church based on what is the hottest thing that they see. And it used to be a number of years ago, I don't know if they still do it even today, but it used to be you'd send in your topic for the message for Sunday, and it would be printed, I think, on a Friday or a Saturday in the newspapers, normally a free service at that point in time. And you were supposed to come up with a better topic than anybody else had so that it would be more attractive for people to come to church. Some see church as a spiritual gas station. When I begin to decline spiritually, when things are going bad in my life, then I'll come and fill up on a Sunday morning, get recharged, re-energized, refilled, and then until I run out again, that's kind of how I handle it. Uh, some see the church as that which is marked and must be marketed in an attractive manner. That our job is to draw as many customers to the church as we possibly can and Therefore, it needs to be entertaining and it needs to be attractive, uh, more so than maybe anybody else, because unfortunately, there are too many who see other churches as competition, which is not. We're in the same kingdom if we're following Christ. I read recently of uh, the fact that churches are seen, you know, you get these marketing people to come in and, and tell you how to do it better, and that is, well, you need, to, you need to sand down some of the rough edges of your theology so that you aren't as offensive as someone else might be. I read this past week of uh, two individuals who claim to be uh, Christians, and I'm not saying they aren't, That's, that, I've not, not met them in person, but they're uh, professional um, athletes. And there was this com uh, comparison between person A and person B. Person A seemed to get a lot of static and a lot of pushback in, in regards to his profession of faith, and uh, person B didn't get that pushback, and, 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 and this person was evaluating, why is that? And his analogy, or his analysis, and I think he was correct, was that person A referred to the fact that you need Jesus, that we don't get Jesus on our own, that we don't earn and merit Christ, that all of us are sinners in need of a Savior, and he shares that very, very prolifically, whereas uh, athlete B has this tendency to just throw out some really nice verses that are kind of uh, psychological verses. Uh, you know, you can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, that's a good verse, but you need to look at the context. And so it was that person B kind of sanded off the rough edges. Let's not, about, not talk about sin. Let's, let's not talk about Jesus and his death on a cross. Let's just make it something that's really, really attractive, almost like a psychological approach. I don't know that that's what person B intends to do, but that's the way it comes across. And so there are those who tell us, as far as the church is concerned, it, we need to determine what are we, what are we going to be, how are we attractive. I mean, after all, the customer is always right, right? And so if you're looking for customers in the church, you need to meet, meet those particular needs. There's grown up a Christian industrial complex that uh, really works toward that, and I'm bombarded by my, in my email box, etc., about all these ways in which, hey, come in, I know, hire us to do this and hire us to do that, and you can be more attractive and you can do better. I'm not saying we, we shouldn't try to do a better job for the kingdom of God, but primarily it's all about marketing and very little about the message. 
There are those who think that church is just basically Sunday. If I show up on Sunday again, occasionally, but it's just Sunday, and then I go about my rest of my week, that that's all that's involved, that that was, that was church when we came together. It's interesting to watch as uh, we've gone to more online church, as it is called, because of COVID. And we're trying to respond. How do we respond to the opportunities of our day? How do, how do we continue to minister? And I'm not suggesting that, that doing some online stuff is not good. It's been very helpful. People who are sick, people who have been exposed, people who can't be there, and, and even the ability to, to go on and join a church family when you're traveling. Just recently came out, of, some of you are aware that Facebook is changing its name to Meta with the idea of really pushing itself to be virtual reality. And just recently, there's a church that has a launched a virtual reality church service where you can put on your Oculus Quest device, your VR device, and you can do church, except you can't do church by yourself. So, as we deal with COVID and as we think through what, what is a church and how do we respond, and we keep, you know, people say, man, I'd love to go back to the olden days, you know, like uh, 2019 even. Those are the olden days. Well, you, you know, I want to get back to what it used to be. Well, this might be what it is. And so how do we minister? How do we serve in our community? How do we reach people for Christ? How do we be the church given the context in which we are? I saw, uh, again, just a headline of looking at uh, 2022, and people are more discouraged about this year heading into it already. So how do we bring hope of the good news of Jesus and what it means to know him and what we as a church are called to do? And we have great opportunities in front of us because the times make that possible. And so I want to, we want to spend the month of January just thinking through what, what is a church and that we are the church and what is it that God is calling us to do. And so this morning I want to give it to us kind of an overview, part one as it were. So we're going to hit a number of verses, which I try not to do too much because I don't really want this to be a Bible drill, you know, where you have to flip through quickly and find it and whatnot. We'll try to get most of them on, on the screen for you. There will be a couple that we'll go to in person uh, in a Bible, but we want to understand. So, so what is the, the purpose of church? There are three questions I want us to answer this morning. The three questions are this. What is the church? When was it formed? And why? What's the purpose? So as we begin, I want to think in terms of answering the question, what is church? And perhaps a, a very important aspect of that is to answer the question, well, what does the word mean, right? What does the word mean? You've probably heard that it comes from a Greek word, ekklesia, and, and it's a compound word. That word is, is a compound word, ek, meaning out, and kaleo, meaning being called. So it's a group of people who have been called out. It has the idea of, of an association, but they're called out for a specific purpose. The word is used, the church is used of the universal church of Jesus Christ. And it refers to the fact that every single person from the beginning of the church until I take it to the rapture of the church, the church is taken out, that every single person within that window is part of the church. Old Testament Israel is not, and we'll look at that in a moment. And they had a responsibility, they had something that God had called them to do, but we have something that we are called to do. And so we are called to be the church. There's a universal church that's made up of individuals who know Christ from the very beginning of the church who have now died, gone to heaven. They're still part of that. Those who are living today and those who will live before Jesus returns for his church. And so it is the church's one body and begins at a certain point and goes until the rapture. But there's also the local church. And this is how the word is primarily used in the New Testament because the epistles, the letters that Paul is writing is writing to local churches. The local churches are a witness to the community around them of the fact and reality of who Jesus is. So being part of the universal church, when you trust Jesus Christ, 
When you become a follower of Jesus, you become part of the universal church. But then there is the importance of identifying with a local church, and we'll, we'll look at that more later in, in, in a few weeks. A local church becomes the witness to the community around us that we're identifying with this particular body, this particular group. And so Paul uses the term, he says, the church that is in Corinth, the church that is in Philippi, the church that is in Rome. And we could say the church that is Valley Grace, and you can use that of any other church even within the community of, uh, within our town or city of Hagerstown or whatever that are, that's a church that follows Christ. There are a number of errors that are associated with the term church. It's, we often use this, this idea, I'm going to church, to think in terms of going to a building, but it's never used that way, that we, in a sense, it is the church when we assemble together, but when we leave, it's just a building. And we, so we, we come to meet, and maybe the old school people used to refer to it as the meeting house Maybe that's a good way to, to deal with it, you know, that I'm going to the meeting house to be with the church. So it's never used of a physical structure. It's never used of a state or national, the state church. We don't have that here in America so much, but in earlier days in Germany and France and Great Britain, there was and still is in some sense a state church. The word is uh, never used of Israel per se, though in a moment, well, might as well. T- the, the word is used in the, in the uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament. If you recall, Old Testament was, was uh, written in Hebrew and some Aramaic. And then the Old Testament was translated into Greek. And there are times in which the word assembly, ekklesia, is used in the Greek translation referring to the assembly of the Jewish people. But that's entirely different than a New Testament church, as I hope to be able to show you a little later on this morning. So there are a number of metaphors that are also used of the church. The church is a body. The church is a flock. The church is a building. The church is made up of, built, uh, of stones. You get the idea, looking at the metaphors, that it isn't a matter of being a lone person, that church is not just one individual. It includes and incorporates other individuals. There's a unity. Body has this idea of unity, yet diversity, doesn't it? And so it's spoken of by Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 5, if you want to find Ephesians, we'll be in there a little bit, kind of bounce around between a couple of chapters. But in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 23, the the apostle Paul writes this, For the husband is the head of wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. That what, just as in that relationship at home, that Jesus Christ, let's look at specifically that Jesus Christ in verse 23, Christ is the head of the church. He is the head of the body. This this church does not belong to a pastor. It doesn't belong to to the leaders within the church. It, in, in reality, it doesn't belong to those who are part of the church. We are a body, but Jesus is the head of the church. It's his church. And then jumping down to verse 25, it's in the middle of it, just as Christ, husbands are to love their wives, just also as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We'll come back to that in a little bit later on that there was a heavy price that was paid by Jesus in order to form the church. That there's something significant about the church if it costs Jesus his life, right? And so there's diversity, and yet there is unity. So that we are united in the invisible church, which you can't see. We can't see our union with Christ. We can't, you can't see the fact that I've been united with Jesus when I trusted Christ. You can't see that. That's what Jesus referred to in John 3 when he had a conversation with Nicodemus. You, you can't see when a person is born again, but you can see the evidence of it. So we can't see the union with the invisible Christ 
But we can see a local church because it's made up of people. We have bodies. And so therefore, we become a visible representation within our community that we have a connection to the person of Jesus. So what is the church? It's a group of people who've been called out, and in our context, been called out from the world to be on mission for Jesus. Well, when did the church begin? Well, in a very real sense, it began in the councils of heaven before time. Way back before time began, in the councils of heaven among the Godhead, there's a conversation, and I don't even, I don't even know how to describe that in human terms to, to be theologically correct. But somewhere in the councils of heaven past, God had determined that he was going to institute the church, just as in the councils of heaven past, it was determined that Jesus would come and die on the cross for those who needed salvation, which is all of humanity. So in a sense, it starts way back then, but we're, we're bound by time, aren't we? I mean, we're, we're creatures of time, you know, in Genesis 1, in the beginning, there was a beginning of time. So... In Matthew chapter 16, you, we're going to try and put some of these verses up so you don't have to flip back and forth, but keep your place in Ephesians. We'll be back there, Lord willing. In uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus says this. He's, he's talking to Peter, and he says, I say to you, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, there's some things that are very important to notice in the text. Jesus said that he's going to build his church. I will build my church. I'm going to do it. Notice also the tense, its future. So at the time in which Jesus is speaking, the church has not yet been formed. It has not yet begun. It's a future tense. <clears throat> I will build my church. If this was a continuation of something else that had already been going on, Jesus should have said, I will continue to build my church, which be a present tense. And so Jesus says, I will build my church. It is something yet future from when Jesus is speaking here, and it is his church. We are invited to be part of his church, and we ought not to forget that. That those who don't belong, as we'll see in just a few more minutes, those who don't belong get a chance to be invited into his church. I'm grateful for those who have served in leadership and those of you who are part of Valley Grace that I think we're comprehending that this is his church. It doesn't belong to any of us. We may have incorporation papers, but ultimately... <clears throat> the legal stuff doesn't trump the theological. And so we are his church, and Jesus said, I will build my church. I'm going to do it. I will continue to do it. And the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, or using an Old Testament term, the gates of Sheol will not overpower it. That, that refers to the place of the departed dead. And it also can refer to everything that Satan and the enemy wants to throw at us. And Jesus goes on to say that I'm going to continue to build my church in spite of Satan, in spite of the enemy, in spite of COVID. I will build my church. So we have the guarantee that Jesus will continue to build his church. I think the best understanding for when the church began is at the day of Pentecost. And uh, let me give you four evidences for that. And this is not designed to, I, I don't desire that this just be a checklist. I want us to learn some things from this. But going back again to Ephesians, at this time to chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to start reading in verse 1. And we only have uh, like verses, I think, 4, 5, and 6 uh, that will be projected for you. And, Jesus, and, and Paul writes this, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ. And when you find that in your text, you ought to ask, so what's the reason? What is he saying? 
If you go back to the previous section, chapter 2, <clears throat> Paul talks about the fact that we are saved by grace. That's Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And then beginning in verse 11, it talks about the fact that we are united into one body. That when we trust Christ, we become part of the church, and then we pick it up, and for this reason, Paul wants us to know, what is this church about? What do we do? <clears throat> What's it mean to live as one body? For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, <clears throat> notice the emphasis there on Gentiles as opposed to whom? Jews. If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, and Paul became a messenger and evangelist to Gentiles. That was his main emphasis. That by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote to you before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. When we come across that word mystery in scriptures, it means something that had been hidden previously but has now been revealed. So Paul is saying there's something that was hidden in the past. You, you couldn't have figured this out. I tell you by reading Old Testament scripture. You can come to know Jesus by reading Old Testament scripture because Jesus said that to Nicodemus. All he had was Old Testament scripture. You can know who Jesus is. You can be born again. But there's a mystery that you cannot know from Old Testament scripture. And Paul says there's this mystery of Christ. Verse 5, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men. So this mystery was hidden. People didn't know it. They didn't understand it. As it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and the prophets in, in the spirit. So Paul is saying this, this mystery that I'm getting ready to tell you about in verse 6 has been hidden from the past. So what is, what is this mystery? To be specific... That the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ through the gospel. You would not have known from the Jewish scriptures that Gentiles had the opportunity to be part of this body. In fact, Gentiles were separated. Even you could become a follower of God, the follower of the Lord of the Old Testament, but you would be a proselyte. You remember that there was a court of the Gentiles. You could come to worship God, but you could not go into where the Jews were because there was this separation. So there was a separation between Jews and Gentiles. And now Paul is saying, but in the church, there's no longer that separation. In fact, Galatians says the same thing. No longer Jew and Gentile, slave or free. That there is given to us the opportunity to be on equal standing. Notice what he says. We are what? Fellow heirs. With whom? The Jewish people. We, we share together now because we're the church. Prior to this, we were not fellow heirs. But we are joint heirs, our fellow heirs. We have equal inheritance. We are fellow members. We belong to the same body. No longer is there a divide between Jew and Gentile. We are fellow partakers. We get to take part in it just as legally as the Jewish people did in the Old Testament, but now there's something new. That God has formed, Jesus has formed a church in which there's no longer a distinction between Jew and Gentile. That we are fellow heirs, that we are fellow members, that we are fellow partakers with the Jewish people. And for some of us who aren't probably most of us in this room who don't have Jewish heritage, we ought to be really thankful. Because had I been born in Old Testament times as a Gentile and not a Jewish individual, I, I could worship God. I could be led toward God. I could come to know and, and, and live under the authority and the blessing and the worship of the Lord, the Lord himself, Christ, Messiah, but I had to stay outside. There was a barrier. And there, there no longer is. In fact, I think that's part of what took place. You remember when Jesus was crucified on the cross, the, the barrier between the Holy of Holies and the holy place was broken, that place that only 
uh, the high priest could go in once a year. It was about, about six inches thick. It was ripped from top to bottom as if God is reaching down and saying, this barrier is no longer there. That we, we get to be fellow partakers, joint heirs. And so that truth wasn't taught, in, in, as we see in verse 5 of Ephesians 3. In Acts chapter 20, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul uh, says that the, the church had to be bought by Christ. <clears throat> so it had to happen after Christ. In Ephesians, excuse me, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul is addressing the Ephesian lead, uh, elders. He he's, has this idea he's not going to see them again, and so he's giving to them, in a sense, his last words. We want you to re- I want you to remember these things. And so he addresses these elders, and he says to them, be on guard for yourselves and all of the flock. These we would, could say were pastors, were shepherds. And so Paul tells them, I want you to pay attention to yourself and also to your flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, To do what? To shepherd the church of God. You see, again, this is no pastor's church. The church belongs to Jesus. And Paul is challenging and saying, I want you to oversee this church which belongs to God, which he purchased with his own blood. That in order for the church to exist, Jesus had to die. Therefore, it had to be after that time. But don't miss, don't miss the importance of that. The church cost Jesus his life. Too often, I'm afraid, I even find myself at times not putting the emphasis upon the church of Jesus Christ that I ought to put because this cost Jesus his life. Jesus died for his church. So is it important? I don't think there's any greater gift, right? And so it's a reminder to us that Jesus died for his church. And the only way the church could begin was the fact that Jesus died for his church. He purchased it with his own blood. We know from the Old Testament, the sacrifices, etc., were looking forward. They were looking forward to the coming of Christ who would go to the cross to pay for sins and failures. And so the blood of bulls and goats, as we're told in the book of Hebrews, merely covered sin until Jesus came. And then when Jesus came, he, he completed what those were metaphors for, what they looked forward to. On that side of the cross, uh, Old Testament side, you look forward to the They were looking forward to what Jesus was going to do. Maybe didn't understand it all. But it was just taking God and being obedient to him. On this side of the cross, those of us who are on the AD side, Anno Domini of our Lord, you know, we look back and, and we get it that Jesus purchased us. So we look back by faith. They look forward by faith. Where were they looking? To the cross of Jesus. And that's why the message of the church has got to be, it's the cross of Jesus Christ that pays for our sins and our failures, dear friends. We can't sand that down. We can't make it more palatable. Well, let's not talk about sin, and let's not talk about death, and let's not talk about the bloodshed of Jesus. That's offensive. No, it's the only way to have a relationship with God. And so our message has to be the cross of Jesus Christ. It's what starts the church and what gives us life. We also see the fact by the evidence of the the work of the Holy Spirit that the church had to be formed, I think, on the day of Pentecost. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 There's this reference that is made, for by one spirit we were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. So the Apostle Paul is writing, and in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says, this has already happened. We were baptized by one spirit. This is, this is not water baptism. It is referring to the fact of being baptized by the Holy Spirit. And he said, we were baptized, again, into this one body, Whether we're Jew or Gentile, we come in exactly the same way. 
And so we've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. And when Paul is writing this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it has already happened because the church has been formed. If we jump back to John chapter 14, Jesus makes a prediction again of the coming of the church. So in John chapter 14, the church is not here. And Jesus says this, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. So what, what Jesus is saying in John 14, looking forward, that God is, God's going to give you the Holy Spirit. It's his promise. But he's not here yet. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says he's already come. If we look, for example, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, that in the upper, they gathered them together in the upper room. He command, Jesus is commanding them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the pro Father had promised. What had the Father promised? Takes us back to John 14. The Holy Spirit's coming. So Jesus is telling his disciples, you stay here in Jerusalem. Don't leave Jerusalem until you get the promise of, that God gave, that I gave to you back in John 14. So stay here. It's not yet come. So you stay here. Which he said, and he heard of me, for John baptized with water, I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then we jump to Acts chapter 11, and we read this. And, I, and as I began to speak the Holy Spirit, there's, there's a statement that's being given of what, what has taken place. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it did upon us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So somewhere between Acts 1 and Acts 11, there was this coming of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Am I making it clear? So somewhere in between those two things, John 14, I'm going to give you a promise. The Holy Spirit's going to come. And in, in 1 Corinthians 12, he's already come. Acts 1, stay here until the Holy Spirit comes. Acts 11, uh, he's already here. So when did he come? Acts 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues of fire as of distributing themselves and rested upon each one. The word that's used there for rested means sat upon. And so that, to me, is when the church began, was at Pentecost. And it's from that point on until the rapture of the church, till, till uh, we go to meet Jesus in the air, that the church is being formed. We are neither Jew nor Gentile. There is a brand new entity that God has given to us. And it is the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. It's the church that he purchased with his own blood. And I think we need to connect that, I do, more so in my own thinking, not just the church, but this is the church that Jesus purchased with his own blood. So what is the church? We're a called out group. We're called out from the world. When did that happen? I think it happened at Pentecost to be the church of Jesus Christ, purchased with those, his own blood, What's our mission? Why did he do it? Why did God do that? I think we find that in Matthew chapter 28. But before we jump there, let me give you just a really quick overview. So you've been doing that already. Well, I'm sorry. But, but a quick overview. You remember, you, you remember the story, you know, Adam and Eve placed in the garden, have, have fellowship with God. It's like God wanted human beings to have the privilege of knowing him of worshiping him, of walking with him, of fellowship with the creator of the universe. That was God's desire. That's why he created man. God didn't need us. And so he creates Adam and he puts him in the garden and God would come down as we read in the, in the cool of the evening to enjoy a relationship with, with Adam and Eve. And it didn't take very long till sin entered into the world. Adam and Eve sinned against God. God put within the center of the garden a test for them because God's not interested in robots. God could have kept that away, you know, and they lived happily ever after. No, they were just robots. God doesn't force any of us to become followers of Jesus. And so he put a test there in, in the Garden of Eden, and they failed the test. Our great, 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 and you had a bunch of great grandparents failed on that one. And, and we do too. We can't say, well, it's all their fault. I look at me and I say, that's my fault. 
And, and, and so began then the, the procreation and, and the filling of the earth. And, and what began to happen was that there were those who, who didn't know God. There are many who didn't know God. And so God raised up a, a group of people, the Jewish people, in order that they would worship God and witness for God. That was their calling. God said, I didn't choose you because you were great. I didn't choose you because you were mighty. I didn't choose you because there were a lot of you. I didn't choose you because of anything special. I just chose you because I determined to choose you. You're the smallest of the nations, Israel. But I want you to worship me, and I want you to be a witness to the world around me that there is a God. And this is during a time that's very polytheistic. And as you recall, the Jewish... The Jewish faith, if I can use that terminology, is monotheistic. So it had to be revealed that there's only one true God. And that was in the context of those who were worshiping sun and moon and stars and trees and earth and rocks and and all this other kind of stuff. And God said, no, 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 there's there's only one God. And so the Jewish nation was their responsibility to be a witness and to worship. You know the story like many of us. They got a little proud in the fact that we are God's chosen people. And they forgot to tell people around them who the one true God was, and in their worship, they corrupted it. And yet in the providence of God, Jesus is coming, and God says, I I still want people to worship me, and I still want a witness for me, and therefore he designed and created the church. That's our calling. But we no longer have a barrier between race, between nationality, between economic strata. There's no caste system. And so our calling is to to worship God and to be a witness. The same thing God wants. We're called out from the world because we're called to be different. We're called to live differently so that we can point people to our God. And that we have the privilege to worship him. And so in Matthew chapter 28, as Jesus is preparing to leave this earth, he's preparing to send back into heaven. He gives the marching orders to his disciples, which were the foundation then of the church. And this becomes our marching orders. And Jesus says to them, here's what I want you to do. And Jesus, uh, beginning in verse 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. (laughs) That ought to get our attention. If someone comes up to you and says, I have all authority, heaven and earth, let me just give you a little memo. I've got a suggestion. No, he's saying pay attention. There's something very important that I'm getting ready to say. If I've got all authority in heaven on earth, listen up. And then Jesus says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe and all that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Which is a really good thing, because this is Jesus' mission. And we need him to carry out his mission. And actually, in in the, the translation, it's having gone, it's assuming that we are going. And what's the main verb? Make disciples. Make disciples. Make followers of Jesus. That you and I are called to live as followers of Jesus. We're called out of the world. We're called to be different. We're not supposed to look like the world around us and act like the world around us because we're called to be the representatives of Jesus Christ. In a world that is dark, (laughs) some of you might remember King James uses the the word, we are called to be a peculiar people. Now, some of us are just more peculiar than others, but that's not what it means. We are to be set apart so that we conduct ourselves in our homes differently than the world. We conduct ourselves differently out and about in our work. We conduct ourselves differently because we are called out with the same message to introduce people to Jesus, to make followers of Jesus. And that starts with realizing none of us are born headed to heaven. None of us are born part of his church. None of us are born in a relationship with him. But we're invited. 
We're not forced, but we're invited. And so this morning, if there's someone here who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus, I, I would, Paul says, I would beg you, and I would say the same thing. Because it's eternal life that begins here and now and goes on forever. And so our calling is to introduce people to Jesus, the only hope for mankind. When you have conversations with individuals, <laughs> you know, hey, what do you think? It's brand new year. We get, you know, God's got something. Oh, I think it's going to just be another one of the same old, same old. We know God came through Jesus to give us life and to give us hope. And it's a win-win for us, really. We live our life for him, and when we're called home to glory, man, that's a bigger win yet. I'm not trying to be morbid, but it's the end of us all, and we have hope in Christ. And so we're called to introduce people to Jesus and help them to become a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, to make followers of Jesus. That, that's our goal, and that's our mission. Salvation is a free gift, dear friends. We don't do anything to earn it. But discipleship is costly. It means we pull back from the world to tell them about the good news of Jesus. The church is God's means to make followers of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have called us to be part of your family. We were called and we responded. If there's someone here who's not yet responded to that invitation, that even today we might have the privilege, they might ask somebody they came with, look around, say, tell me what it means. What does it mean to know Christ? Father, thank you for each one who calls Valley Grace their home and each one who serves in the process of helping to draw people closer to you, whether it's telling the good news to begin with, asking people to respond, or once that response is there, that trusting Christ, what does it mean to grow in Christ? And Father, the opportunities in front of us are phenomenal as followers of Jesus. You've promised Lord, that you're going to build your church. It's your church. And the gates of hell can't stand against it. You promised in this passage we just read that you're with us even to the end of the age, enabling and helping and encouraging so that we might lead others to Christ and walk in a deeper manner with you. Thank you for inviting us into your church. Thank you for inviting us into your family. Thank you for your creation of a body of believers. And so it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go, dear friends, and look for opportunities to share with others around us the hope we have in Christ. You're dismissed.